Our election system has several major challenges right now. Maybe it might be described as a challenge in every area. The biggest one we're facing at this moment is the dismantling of the campaign finance system. It is the Wild West out there, thanks to the Supreme Court, and we're seeing huge amounts of dark money flow into the system in a fashion we haven't ever seen before. And that is fundamentally altering the dynamic within the parties and among the parties. In addition to dark money, our election system is pretty ramshackle in the way that we run elections. I was a direct witness to this when I was uh, in the boiler room for the Obama campaign in 2008 in 2012 and going across my screen you could see all the problems that were happening in the swing states as the day unfolded. It's clear that we have underfunded our system, that it is often run by amateurs, um, almost always run by partisans, and the result is a system that doesn't look anything like uh, the systems of other modern democracies. We lose too many votes, the lines are too long, it is too hard to register, and there are a variety of problems that voters encounter along the way, uh, which sort of defy logic uh, and are really completely inconsistent with the way we ought to think about voting, which is as a customer service model. The way we run our elections has an effect uh, deeply on campaigning uh, and deeply on what happens on election day. The same problems we saw in Bush v. Gore, the same problems we saw in Ohio in 2004, we're seeing a lot of the same issues coming up over and over again because we just haven't fixed the underlying problem. And on the money side, I mean, I, I think the money side is far deeper uh, in terms of its effect on our election system because it's not just affecting what happens on election day, it's affecting everything that happens after election day. In this highly polarized system that we have, um, intra-party groups are basically using money to push the parties in different directions. Um, and when voters are as polarized as they are, when politicians are as polarized as they are, it's becoming sort of a fight for the death inside the party and outside of it. So uh, the result we, is somewhat what we see in Washington, um, which is complete deadlock. I, you know, I, I, now, I teach separation of powers, and this is how I begin it. Once upon a time, Congress passed laws. That just isn't true anymore because um, no one can even get a join on a bill um, to push through, through the House or the Senate. And so unless we fix that problem, which is related to money and a variety of other things, we are not going to be able to govern ourselves going forward. Both of these proposals share the same feature. That is, they are designed not to be the perfect be-all, end-all proposal, but to help us get from here to there and reform. Because we all have a lot of ideas what we want for the there, what, what the fix is, and we all know what's wrong with the here, but very few people think about the here to there. So let me just give you an example. Right now in campaign finance, one of the central problems is dark money. And we can't get the regulations passed on the Hill, not even the regulations to make that money transparent. So the proposal that my co-authors and I have is to affix at the end of an ad that is paid for by, by, by dark money the fact that this organization does not disclose all of its donors. So it would, it would do two things. So first it would give us a signal uh, to voters to tell them maybe they should keep an eye on that ad and, and, and think about what its source might be. But it also is going to enable us to trace where the dark money is and how, to, and how to find it. The hope is then it starts to build the case to pass more meaningful reform. That's why it's a here to their solution. And the Democracy Index works in a similar way, although probably on a broader scale. So the, I should just say it's, it's actually been made real. It's called an election performance index and was made into reality by the Pew Foundations. And so the magic of the election performance index is that it creates the right kinds of incentives for states to get better. So we have an election administration system that doesn't work, and we all have a lot of ideas about how to make it work better, but we have no ideas how to create the right incentives to get there, and, and in some ways we actually don't have all the, sen all the good ideas about how to fix it. We, we actually know shockingly little about how the system works, and so that's why it's a here to there solution. It both creates a lot of incentives for states to do better because it ranks them, but it also helps us figure out the drivers of performance. Um, so one of the sort of big surprises when we started ranking the states was that some of our intuitions about what, what drives performance turned out not to be true. Um, so you see, for example, poor states and wealthy states doing you know, pretty well on the index and doing pretty badly on the index. It's not obvious that region affects uh, uh, where people end up on the index. So we're, we're learning a lot about what drives performance, both as to each of the indicators and as to performance overall. And that, going forward, is going to help us choose better solutions once we're able to pass them.
On the election administration side, virtually everyone is a better, better model than we are. I mean, I just remember I was in India and I was talking about how elections are run in the United States. And India is an incredibly poor country. It's got a lot of problems with corruption. It is just as unruly as ours is in terms of being uh, regionally distributed. And they were still a little shocked by um, how much of a role partisanship plays uh, in the election process. So, so the easy model that is used by virtually every well-developed democracy is to put nonpartisans in charge of running the election system. This is a bureaucratic function. It is not a political function. Um, and, and every other country uh, uh, that, that has a robust democracy has figured that out and has created a, a group of people who are shielded from political pressures to run the election system just like you run any other state agency. Uh, and that leads to a couple of things. So one, it makes sure that politicians don't try to steal elections legally. You know, in, in the world where elections are close, you can shift the rules to advantage your party and, and disadvantage the other party. But two, it also ensures that the people who are chosen to run elections are chosen to run elections because they have the professional capacity to do so. So a lot of election administrators in the United States come through the party system, um, which is fine. They're good parted people. I don't want to suggest that they're you know, evil or partisan motive, but they aren't trained. Uh, and they aren't actually coming in with the kind of administrative skill set that you'd like to see in this context. So one, I'd like to see that model, uh, the nonpartisan election administration put in place. That's the big goal in the long run. And I will say that will do more to ensure fair elections than you know, just about anything else you could do on the election administration side. Uh, on the campaign finance model, um, we uh, need to go back to a world where Congress has the power to regulate. So at this moment, the Supreme Court has created such a narrow uh, band for, the, for Congress to regulate that there's very little that Congress can do at this moment. And unless and until we give Congress the power to enact the, the kinds of regulations we see in other places, we are not going to get anywhere in this process.